So verse 26, I went out. You even have a title there, Visions of the Last Days. Well, that's what it's all been about, but this particularly apply, applies to Israel and to Jerusalem. I went out as the angel told me into this field. And he has various thoughts going through his mind about the earth and things to come. And while these thoughts, verse 38, were in my mind, I looked around to my right and I saw a woman in great distress, mourning and loudly lamenting. Her dress was torn and she had ashes on her head. Abandoning my meditations, I turned to her and said, Why are you weeping? What is troubling you? Sir, she replied, Please leave me to my tears and my grief. Great is my bitterness of heart. Great my distress. Tell me, I asked, what has happened to you? Sir, she replied, I was barren and childless through 30 years of marriage. Every hour of every day during those 30 years, day and night alike, I pray to the Most High. Then after 30 years, my God answered my prayer and had mercy on my distress. He took note of my sorrow and granted me a son. And oh, what happiness I experienced because of my son. But when my son entered his wedding chamber, he fell down dead. So we all put out our lamps and all my neighbors came to comfort me. I control my grief till the evening of the, of the following day. And when they had all ceased urging me to take comfort and control my grief, I arose and stole away in the night and came here to this flowery field. I've made up my mind never to go back to the town, but to stay here eating nothing and drinking nothing and to continue my mourning and fasting unbroken until I die. Now in verse 5, what pseudo estrus goes on to do is to rebuke the woman for sorrowing so much over the loss of a single child, a single son, when, as we know the account to be, the whole nation of Israel and the whole city of Jerusalem has been lost to the Romans. And he argues that point with her, and then he, she argues her point with him that it was her only son that she took 30 years to get, verse 19, but Ezra still continues to argue with her. Do not do what you say, I urge. Be persuaded because of Zion's misfortunes and take comfort to yourself from the sorrow of Jerusalem. You see how our sanctuary has been laid waste, our altar demolished, our temple destroyed. Babylonian captivity? No, Roman captivity. Our harps are unstrung, our hymns silenced, our shouts of joy cut short. The light of the sacred lamp is out. The Ark of the Covenant has been taken as spoil. The holy vessels are defiled. The name which God has conferred on us is disgraced. Our leading men have been treated shamefully. Our priests burn alive. The Levites taken off into captivity. Our virgins have been raped. Our wives ravished. Our God-fearing men carried off. Our children abandoned. On and on and on all that God has done. Verse 25, suddenly... While I was speaking to the woman, I saw her face begin to shine. Her countenance flashed like lightning, and I shrank from her in terror. While I wondered what this meant, she suddenly uttered a loud and terrible cry which shook the earth, this woman now that he is talking to in the field. I looked up and saw no longer a woman, but a complete city built on massive foundations. Through the process of metamorphosis, she turned herself from a woman into a city. I cried aloud in terror. Where is the angel who visited me before? It is his doing that I've fallen into this bewilderment anyway, you know, that all my hopes are shattered and all my prayers in vain. And while I was speaking, the angel appeared to me. Uh, verse 32, I came out to the field and what I've seen here and can still see he says, is beyond my power to relate. So the angel says, stand up like a man and I will explain to you. The answer is in verse 44. The woman you saw is Zion, which you now see as a city with all its buildings. She told you she was childless for 30 years. That was because there were 3,000 years in which sacrifices were not yet offered in Zion. 
Now, well, Paul's there for a moment, and you can review in your mind earlier teachings. What can we glean from this verse? There were 3,000 years in which sacrifices were not yet offered in Zion. When did sacrifices begin to be offered in Zion? Who took Zion and made it the capital? David. When did he live? 1000 BC. And you add three to that. And what's the date of creation? 4000 BC. Remember we ran across that all the time in creation. People were thinking, and people still are today, that we are in the 6,000th year of creation. 2,000 on this side of Christ, 4,000 on that side. Archbishop Usher, as you've gotten some of your King James versions, will give you 4004. And that's what the critics have just raked over the coals and made fun of us about, that we really believe that the earth was created in the year 4004 B.C. Well, we did an exhaustive study in that. It's on the creation tapes. But here's someone else who believe the earth was created in 4000 BC because there were 3000 years prior to the time when sacrifices began to be offered in Zion they were offered under David in 1000 BC you had three to that and the date he believes for the world is 4000 BC and remember according to the whole text and the whole manuscript of second Esdras, they give us the date which we don't have here over in chapter 14 and verse 48 which corresponds to this, 4000 B.C. Of course, it wouldn't say that we're writing now in the year 4000, or let's say 4100. You know, for us, that would be A.D. 100, because remember, this is Ezra. We've got to go back five centuries B.C. to get to his time period. But then, after the 3,000 years, Solomon built the city, offered the sacrifices. That was the time when the barren woman bore her son. You know, she had been barren 30 years, and each decade represents a millennium. Three decades, three millennia. She took great pain, she said, over his upbringing. That was the period when Jerusalem was inhabited. Then she told you of the great loss she suffered and how her son died on the day he entered his wedding chamber. That was a destruction, Babylonian supposedly, but we know Jerusalem, which or Roman, which overtook Jerusalem. Such then was the vision that you saw. In other words, this is an explanation of this great woman of sorrow that he sees. Okay, moving along. The fifth revelation, chapters 11 and 12. The allegory of the eagle. The allegory of the eagle with three heads, 12 wings, and eight smaller wings. A long, long section. But the allegory of the eagle with three heads, twelve wings, and eight smaller wings. Let's get down to verse 36. We've got the introduction of the eagle. Uh, like in verse 23, there you see the eagle's body. He's got three heads, and there are six little wings. That's just a partial number of the full number, but there are six little wings. Then verse 36, I heard a voice which said to me, Look carefully at what you see before you. You know, this eagle is what he has seen. I looked and saw what seemed to be a lion roused from the forest. It roared as if it, it roared as it came, and I heard it address the eagle in a human voice. So now it's lion against the eagle. Listen to what I tell you, it said, the lion to the eagle. The Most High says to you, are you not the only survivor of the four beasts to which I gave the rule over my world? Remember Daniel's four beasts that he has? See, this is based on the book of Daniel. And the rest of this is more of the address of the lion to the eagle. Next chapter, first verse. While the lion was still addressing the eagle, I looked and saw the one remaining head disappear. Now Daniel and John's books have this, heads and horns that represent leaders and empires. And like in uh, the book of Revelation, so many have passed, one now is, and you know, three yet to come, which represent leaders or nations 
Then the two wings which had gone over to him arose and set themselves up as rulers. And their reign was short and troubled, and when I looked at them, they were already vanishing. Then the eagle's entire body burst into flames, and the earth was struck with terror. So he's having to call on the angel to find out what's going on. And we are provided that beginning in verse 10. Here is the interpretation of your vision. The eagle you saw rising from the sea represents the fourth kingdom in the vision seen by your brother Daniel. Daniel had a vision, chapters 2, 7, and 8, a fourfold empire and kingdom that was to arise, that was to govern the world, Gentile kingdoms. And he said the eagle you saw is the same as the fourth kingdom of Daniel but he was not given the interpretation which I am now giving you or have already given you the days are coming when the earth will be under an empire more terrible than any before it will be ruled by 12 kings remember the eagle has 12 wings one after another the second to come to the throne will have the longest reign of all the 12 this is the meaning of the 12 wings that you saw uh, verse 19, as for the eight lesser wings which you saw growing from the eagle's wings, this is what they mean. The empire will come under eight kings whose reigns will be trivial and short-lived. Two of them will come and go just before the middle of the period. Four will be kept back until shortly before its end. And two will be left until the end itself. And as for the three heads, these are the three chief parts of the body three heads, twelve wings, eight small wings. Which you saw sleeping, this is what they mean. In the last years of the empire, the Most High will bring to the throne three kings who will restore much of its strength and rule over the earth and its inhabitants more oppressively than anyone before. And they are called the eagle's heads because they will complete and bring to a head its long series of wicked deeds verse 31 what about the lion well as for the lion which you saw coming for the from the forest roused from sleep roaring which you heard addressing the eagle taxing it with its wicked deeds and words this is the messiah so he believes the fourth kingdom to be under the figure of the eagle and the messiah under the lion like the lion of the tribe of Judah, as Revelation speaks of, whom the Most High has kept back until the end. Now, he's the only one privy to this, we're told in verse 36. It's the secret of the Most High, which no one except yourself has proved worthy to be told. Well, I don't know why Nehemiah wouldn't be told it. Nehemiah is about the same as Ezra for that period. Well, anyway, we won't ask that. Then the sixth revelation, chapter 13. Seven revelations in all. The sixth one, chapter 13, verses 1 to 58. Now it's going to be building upon the lion, first seen back in chapter 11, and then described as being the Messiah in chapter 12 and verse 32. And here in chapter 13, we see a great man, the same as the lion, who rises from a wind-tossed sea. And this is the Messiah. And the people who fight against him are the Gentile nations. And then we see one peaceable group of people, which we'll come to here in a moment. I had a dream. In my dream, a wind came up out of the sea and set the waves in turmoil. And this wind brought a human figure rising from the depths. And as I watched, this man came flying with the clouds of heaven. He asks in verse 15, now show me the meaning of this dream also. Verse 25, this is what the vision means. The man you saw rising from the depths of the sea is he whom the Most High has held, same as in 1232, has held in readiness through many ages. He will himself deliver the world that he has made. 
and determine the lot of those who survive. So this obviously is Messiah, the Son of Man, the Son of God. But then I said we see a peaceable group of people in verses 37 through 40. The peaceable group he describes as the ten lost tribes of Israel. Hmm. Then my son will convict. Then my son will convict of their godless deeds and nations that confront him. Nations or Gentiles. This will correspond to the storm you saw. That's what the turmoil was about. He will taunt them with their evil plottings and the tortures they are soon to endure. This corresponds to the flame. Part of this, of course, we've skipped over. He will destroy them without effort by means of the law. And that is like the fire. Then you saw him collecting a different company, a, a peaceful one. They are the ten tribes which were taken off into exile in the time of King Hoshea, whom Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, took prisoner. He deported them beyond the river, and they were taken away into a strange country. But then they resolved to leave the country populated by the Gentiles and go to a distant land never yet inhabited by man, and there at last to be obedient to their laws, which in their own country they had failed to keep. Now what country do you think that would be? According to false prophecy teachers today, like, Herbert W. Armstrong. Well, that's America. England and the United States of America. They've gone to a land that's never yet inhabited. Why? It hadn't been discovered until 1492. As they passed through the narrow passages of the Euphrates, the Most High performed miracles for them, stopping up the channels of the river until they had crossed over. So it's reminiscent of the Exodus account and the account of them crossing over Jordan under Joshua. Their journey through that region which is called Arzareth, was long, took a year and a half. They have lived there ever since until this final age. Now they are on their way back, and once more the Most High will stop the channels of the river to let them cross. You see how if, uh, if you're a naive, weak person, this fits right in. You follow this British Israeliism and the Armstrongism teaching, you think, well, that's right, God's gathering back his nation together and you know, you see Jews going back to Israel today, and you see a uh, revival of interest about Jews today in this country and about who are the ten lost tribes and where are the ten lost tribes. And if you believe this is a biblical book, then you've got biblical bases for coming up with some of these various errors and deceptions that people are today. <coughs> then chapter 14, you should all be familiar with, this is Ezra's supernatural commission to restore the Jewish books, which we studied in canonicity. Ezra's supernatural commission to restore the Jewish books. But now you see how it fits in the whole perspective here of these seven revelations. It gives very interesting information here, and we've already dealt with this before. We'll just highlight it by picking out a few verses. We're told in verse 21 that the law was destroyed in Babylonian captivity. But we know that not to be true because Daniel had Jeremiah over in Babylon. So you see, we can catch him in a mistake right here. Your law was destroyed in the fire. Fill me with your Holy Spirit says Ezra, so that I may write down the whole story of the world from the very beginning. You know, restore all the books of Moses and the prophets. Go, he replied, call the people together, tell them not to look for you for 40 days. Have a large number of writing tablets. Take some of these scribes with you, five men all trained to write quickly. Then return here and I will light a lamp of understanding in your mind, which will not go out until you have finished all that you are to write. When your work is complete, some of it must be made public, and the rest of it will be given to wise men to keep secret. So verse 37, I took with me the five men as I had been told. We went away to the field, and there we stayed. And on the next day I heard a voice calling me which said, Ezra, open your mouth and drink what I give you. So I opened my mouth and was handed a cup full of what seemed like water except that its color was the color of fire. So I took it and drank, and as soon as I had done so, my mind began to pour forth a flood of understanding. 
wisdom grew greater and greater within me. Now, Ezekiel ate a scroll, but he didn't have strange things like this happen to him. Yeah. I retained my memory unimpaired. I opened my mouth to speak. I continued to speak unceasingly. The Most High gave understanding to the five men who took turns writing down what was said using characters which they had not known before. So it's supernatural enlightenment as well as accompanying supernatural writing. They remained at work through the 40 days, writing all day and taking food only at night. <clears throat> but as for me, I spoke all through the day. Even at night, I was not silent. In the 40 days, 94 books were written. <laughs> now, at the end of the 40 days, the most time, these are the verses that we've used before, spoke to me, Make public the books you wrote first, he said, to be read by good and bad alike. But the last 70 books are to be kept back. Well, how many then were to be published? 24. How many books were in the Jewish canon? 24 books. And this wasn't one of them here. The one who's writing about all of this. His own book was not one of them. If anything, it's one of the 70. Kept back and given to none but the wise among your people. They contain a stream of understanding, a fountain of wisdom, and a flood of knowledge, and I did so. And then 48b or verse 49, this was, this was all done in the such and such year of creation, and then Ezra was bodily assumed into heaven. Okay, the seven revelations. That leaves us with chapters 15 and 16. We've used that several times before. Because that study, that study of canonicity and, well, the, the studies that we did in textual criticism as well are really, well, you just can't hardly do without that if you're really going to know anything about the Bible and be able to work your way around in some of these books. I'm always amazed that when people don't know that, the, you can tell by the terminology that they use. When they call things a manuscript or a text, they call, you know, a King James Bible the text that the translators gave us or something. You can tell they don't know anything what they're talking about. But that can be very, very confusing. And we did a lot of study on that. Here in these last two chapters, we've got denunciations, primarily against Babylon, but really it's Rome under the cover of Babylon. As well as Asia, Egypt, and Syria. Asia, Egypt, and Syria are also mentioned. It's a long series of denunciations. What the title there above, Prophecies of Doom. I guess that's a fairly good title, Prophecies of Doom. Then the book, oh, let's see, like chapter 16, verse 1, there's Egypt, Asia, Syria, and Rome all together. But then from verse 35 of chapter 16 to the end, he's got several little sections that begin with the word listen. And they're directed to the servants of the Lord. All of the other parts of these two chapters in this final section and this second edition to the book just concern prophecies of doom against others. But then if God's going to judge the others, what's going to happen to his people? Well, he says in verse 35, Listen to me, those of you who are the Lord's servant, and take my words to heart. Verse 40, verse 40, Listen to my words, my people. Get ready for battle. Uh, verse 74, Listen, you whom I have chosen, says the Lord, the days of harsh suffering are close at hand, but I will rescue you from them. Away with your fears and doubts, for God is your leader. You who follow my commandments and instructions, says the Lord God, must not let your sins weigh you down, nor your wicked deeds get the better of you. Alas for those who are entangled in their sins and overrun with their wicked deeds. They are like a field overrun by bushes with brambles across the path and no way through, completely shut off and doomed to destruction by fire. So he promises deliverance, protection, salvation for his people. In conclusion, then, to Second Estrus, we'll mention a few errors of the book. Some of these we've already covered before, <clears throat> such as Ezra's 
period in captivity, chapter 3 and verse 1 with verses 28 and 29, would get Ezra dating himself around 556. If he's in captivity 30 years, when he doesn't live until 456. We've given you that before. Just as in the book of Tobit, we see extra canonical angels referred to. The most popular one seen to begin with in uh, the first of the disclosures from heaven to pseudo Ezra, that would be chapter 4 and verse 1, and that's Uriel. Some of these extra canonical angels. We know about Michael, we know about Gabriel from the canon of Scripture. But we also know, if you've read very many books, that somebody's got some names for other angels that float around. Yeah. We covered some of those over in Tobit, and the names of other demons as well in Tobit. Uriel, then in, uh, what, chapter 4 and verse 36, we've got our third archangel, Gabriel, Michael, and, well, Jeremiah. Be another archangel or Jeremiel. So a few extra angels we have. Throughout all of the apocalyptic sections, I think if you study it minutely, which we have not done tonight, you'll find various erroneous teaching. Uh, you just take the account of Ezra writing 94 books by supernatural instruction. That's certainly not valid. I do have a few things marked down. Well, we mentioned this, chapter 5 and verse 8, women giving birth to monsters. Strange things in the apocalyptic sections. This business in chapter 6 and verse 21 that we spend a little time with, children one year old be able, being able to talk, Women with child giving birth to premature babes of three and four months of age after conception who are able to live and leap about. It goes without saying that's not what Isaiah 65 and verse 20 says because this is wrong, we, what we have here in chapter 6 and verse 21 of Second Estrus. Over in chapter 7 and verse 77, one of the popular themes of Catholicism and of most of the apocryphal writings. That is, the meritoriousness of good works. Look in 777. For you have a treasure of good works stored up with the Most High. Let good works bring you merit in the eyes of God. Then in chapter 9... And verse 7, same teaching, whoever comes safely through and escapes destruction, then what can he thank for it? Well, thanks be to his good deeds and to his faith. Chapter 9 and verse 7, again, teaching on good works and so forth and so on. Find many, many, many things if you want to be real technical and go verse by verse and scrutinize the apocalyptic section. Then in chapter 7, verses 28 to 31, something else, we have false teaching concerning the Messiah, which I put by itself because it's rather important. Chapter 7, verses 28 through 31, false teaching concerning the Messiah. My son, God says, the Messiah will appear with his companions and bring 400 years of happiness to all who survive. It's more like a thousand years of happiness that he will bring. So we're getting robbed of 600 years, if we want to go by second estrus. At the end of that time, my son, the Messiah, shall die. Well, he died once for the sins of the people and once only. And so shall all mankind who draw breath. And the world returned to its original silence for seven days. You go on with some more strange material here. 
something else that's strange. According to chapter 2 and verse 18, you know, we got two witnesses over in John's revelation. Everybody thinks they know who it is, Moses and Elijah. Well, he tells us who they are. In 2.18, who the two witnesses will be. Those two witnesses that are going to come and prophesy. I will send my servants Isaiah and Jeremiah. <laughs> That's their interpretation of two witnesses. To help you. As they prophesied, I've set you apart to be my people. I've made ready for you twelve trees, twelve fountains, seven great mountains, and so forth. One positive thing about the book is that it has a positive doctrine of the resurrection. In chapter 1, verses 23 and 31, and in chapter 7 and verse 32, it does have a positive doctrine, evidently of bodily resurrection. But that hardly outweighs all of its faults. Well, you should know tonight that we are through now with the Apocrypha looking individually at the books. And I think we've still got probably several more months of material on the Apocrypha as we conclude this section of our studies.